Clean Hands Save Lives. Written by Thierry Couset. Narrated by Jeff Burt. Chapter 2. The Spiritual Heir of Ignaz Semmelweis. Part 1. The girl screams they should let her give birth right there on the damp pavement. She does not want to be taken to the general hospital, but this child mother has nowhere else to go. Some men lay her out in a cart. She desperately throws herself against them with her last bit of strength. Assuming she's being irrational, they tie her down in order to carry her through the streets. She thinks she is doomed. Like all other paupers in Vienna, Austria of 1847, she knows that in the hospital's maternity ward, one woman out of three dies of puerperal fever, a cervical infection contracted in the time just following childbirth. A young doctor with an egg-shaped skull leans over her bedside. He holds out his hands. I won't poison you, he promises in a strong Hungarian accent. It's difficult to take him seriously. People often make fun of him. The young woman doesn't have the energy for that. Her clothes are removed. He gently examines her. She trembles while he spreads his fingers in order to estimate the dilation of her cervix. He reassures her. The baby is in the right position. She looks around with frightened eyes. There are ten other women present, all of them just as miserable, all just as worried. A twelfth arrives, screaming. The doctor hurries over to her. The doctor examines her, grimaces, and isolates her. She has the fever, the women whisper fearfully. He shakes his head, returns to them, and goes from one on to the next, measuring cervical dilation. In the days that follow, eleven out of the twelve will be dead. Ignaz Semmelweis was stricken with remorse by this incident. He had never been able to bear the death of his patients, and now he had definite proof he was a murderer. This certainty would compel him ten years later to publish an implacable pamphlet aimed at obstetricians. Against them I stand as a resolute adversary, just as one must stand against the parties to a crime. For my part, I can only regard them as assassins. It is not the birthing houses that need to be closed in order to put a stop to the disasters one abhors, but the obstetricians who need to be removed from them. For it is they who act as veritable epidemics." In those dark years, puerperal fever, not yet regarded as a nosocomial infection, was rife. It kills whenever it likes. In Vienna, 28% in November, 40% in January. Its reach extends right around the world, wrote Louis Ferdinand Céline in his medical thesis of 1924. It almost sounds as if he was already preparing the chopped-up prose style he used in his famous novel, Journey to the End of the Night. Death leads the dance, with bells around them. Dubois in Paris reports, 18%. Schuld in Berlin, 26%. Simpson, 22%. In Turin, out of 100 giving birth, 32 die. These figures are similar to the infection rates observed by Didier Pité. But in 19th century Vienna, as in other European cities, they referred to mortality, not infections. In statistical terms, we have certainly retreated from that level of horror. Nevertheless, the number of present-day deaths remains unacceptable. Didier Pité cannot tolerate them any more today than Ignaz Semmelweis could then. Separated by 150 years, they followed parallel trajectories. Chapter 2, Part 2 Didier likes to retell the story of Semmelweis's childhood. He was born in Buda on the Danube's west bank before the city was attached to Pest and became the capital of Hungary. He speaks of Semmelweis's father, a prosperous grocer who wanted his son to become a jurist. Didier must be thinking of his own father, Robert, who was an artisan. So we have two sons of rather modest origins whose parents pushed them towards higher education. Semmelweis left Hungary to complete his law degree in Vienna. However, he turned away from that profession to take up medicine. His professor, named Skoda, took him under his wing. But Skoda seems to fear his student's budding genius and preferred to steer him towards obstetrics in order not to be overshadowed. In contrast, Francis Waldvogel supported Pite. He encouraged Didier to develop his talent. 
These two lives that began with great similarity begin to experience significant differences. The main cause of their divergence, however, is already quite obvious. Semmelweis was all fire, wrote Louis Ferdinand Céline, but Didier burns with a more enchanting flame. All of his nurses speak to me of him with knowing smiles, describing his powerful charisma. Faced with the ravages of purpural fever, Semmelweis was at as much of a loss as Didier when confronted by nosocomial infections. So he observed, measured, reported his findings, and made a fundamental discovery. At the General Hospital in Vienna, two maternity clinics were located side by side. In the clinic run by Professor Klein, in which medical students attended births, mortality was higher than in the clinic overseen by Professor Barch, where midwives were in attendance. 9% compared to 3% over the period between 1841 and 1846. And these averages were almost reassuring because they smoothed over some truly horrific peaks. The difference could not be attributed to the patients themselves. Equally impoverished and abandoned, they were sent to one clinic or the other on alternate days. Nor could one suspect that some mysterious pollutant in the air halted as if by magic at the door to Barch's clinic. The cosmic terrestrial or atmospheric causes invoked in connection with purpural fever have no basis in fact since one dies more often in Klein's clinic than in Barch's, and more often in a hospital than in the city at large, where the cosmic, terrestrial, or whatever conditions you like are quite the same. The cause I am seeking is in our clinic and nowhere else, Semmelweis deduced. It did not take him long to deduce that the medical students played a key role in the tragedy. As a test, Semmelweis sent them to attend births in Barch's clinic and observed the mortality rates reversed. He had no explanation, but at least he found the guilty parties. He asked them why they had not questioned the reasons for the death of certain patients when others survived. Concerning the work in Professor Klein's clinic, he wrote, All that is done here seems quite futile to me. The deaths simply go on, one after another. Semmelweis's relationship deteriorated with Klein as the latter seemed completely indifferent to the carnage for which he was responsible. Semmelweis traveled to Venice during a leave from the hospital. Upon his return, he learned that one of his friends died. Jacob Kolechka was an anatomy professor who was wounded during an autopsy by a student and died several days later with symptoms of purpural fever. However, his death was not entirely in vain. Everything lit up with a macabre glow. It is the fingers of the students, soiled while performing dissections, which carry the fatal cadaveric particles to the genital organs of pregnant women and, in particular, to the region of the cervix, Semmelweis concluded. If Barch's clinic was less affected by purpural fever, it was because the midwives there did not perform autopsies. That same night, Semmelweis roamed the hospital looking for the most corrosive and foul-smelling product used by the cleaning staff. He found chlorinated lime solution, whose disinfecting properties had been demonstrated by a French pharmacist in 1822. The following day, he demanded that the entire staff rub their hands with this vile mixture for five minutes before leaving the autopsy room. It was veritable torture. The solution caused stinging in the eyes and irritated skin to the point of bleeding, but the results were there for all to see. Mortality rates plummeted. Then came a fateful day in October 1847 when Semmelweis lost 11 women following successive vaginal examinations. He deduced from this tragedy that disease particles could also be transferred between living persons. The hands, by simple contact, can be infectious. He then imposed a protocol of hand hygiene with chlorinated lime between examinations of each patient. The mortality rate fell to 0.23%. It was a prodigious success, one of the greatest medical feats of all time. Yet, Semmelweis was dismissed from the hospital. Chapter 2, Part 3 In 1994, Didier understood that neglect of hand hygiene was, in large part, the cause of the infections observed at the hospital of the University of Geneva. He could not help but recall the tragedy that befell Semmelweis. He drew lessons from the failures of his predecessor, and there were many. Semmelweis behaved like a tyrant, often violently. A poor psychologist, 
he imposed his remedy and permitted no discussion. He ignored the chlorinated lime's awful smell, the irritations, and the inevitable cases of dermatitis. The immediate consequence was that the students complained of unhealthy hand-washing, and soon they were boycotting it altogether. To Semmelweis, this was sheer stupidity in the face of the cruel mortality figures, and thus intolerable. According to Louis Ferdinand Céline, the medical students went so far as to deliberately contaminate patients in an attempt to discredit Semmelweis's methods. Semmelweis entrusted his friends with the task of stepping forward in his defense, but errors slipped into their speeches on his behalf, which were ultimately used to denounce him. Cursed with a combination of excessive enthusiasm, intolerance, and pride, he made no effort to be pleasant to anyone. He chose to stand alone against all adversity, to see himself as some sort of heroic knight. Semmelweis wrote in a letter, Destiny has chosen me to be the missionary of truth with respect to the measures one must take to avoid and combat the purpural scourge. I have long since ceased to reply to the attacks I am constantly subjected to. The order of things must prove to my opponents that I am entirely right without it being necessary for me to participate in polemics that can now in no way serve the progress of truth. In his medical thesis, Louis Ferdinand Céline offers a scathing verdict. As for Semmelweis, it seems that his discovery outstripped the powers of his genius. The Hungarian clung to an ideal conception of the truth. He forgot that once applied, hand hygiene could save the lives of millions of women. He gave up his combat on the grounds that he was right and that fighting to win people over would demean him. He did not take the trouble to listen. He heaped insults upon his adversaries. He was clumsy, boorish a man too driven to consider of the happiness of his contemporaries. He neglected his few friends, and then he left them suddenly. Returning to the city of his birth, he ended up securing a post in another maternity clinic. There he wrote his great work in which he exhaustively elaborated his theory, supported by dozens of statistical tables. He discovered that the epidemic of purpural fever began in the 1820s, when the practice of autopsies first became widespread. Soon promoted head of the clinic, he again imposed a hand hygiene protocol and repeated his spectacular results. But he was once more dismissed, too insensitive to the needs and desires of those around him to persuade them to change their behavior. He did not know how to lead them without resorting to the whip. Wounded, embittered, he walked the streets of Buddha and of Pest, putting up posters warning husbands not to place their wives in the hands of obstetricians. Anyone who enters a maternity ward without washing their hands is a criminal, he proclaimed. This brilliant innovator would soon sink into madness, a degeneration that was accelerated by syphilis. He died at the age of 47 before Pasteur founded the science of microbiology. Forty years after his disappearance, his reputation would be restored. Céline wrote in his thesis, He showed us the dangers of wanting too much good for men. It's an age-old lesson that is always renewed. Suppose that today, in a similar fashion, another naive person comes along to cure cancer. He has no idea what kind of tune he'll be forced right away to dance to. It would be truly phenomenal. Oh, he'd need to be careful. Oh, he'd better be forewarned. He'd really have to watch his step. Didier read this warning when he plunged into Semmelweis's work. An obvious truth stared him in the face. One cannot do good for others, and still less for the community as a whole, against their will. Before proposing a plan of action, Didier would need to observe health care workers constantly. He would not be listened to unless he studied their every gesture. A whole set of human factors needed to be integrated into the plan. Being right too soon would serve no purpose. Chapter 2, Part 4 In 1994, Didier studied the entire body of scientific literature on hand hygiene. There were several studies on the efficacy of antiseptic soap, but since Semmelweis, the existing state of affairs was often simply accepted. Medical personnel knew that they should wash their hands, but no one attached much importance to the practice. Doctors preferred to take an interest in more technical matters, leaving the whole question of hand hygiene to the nurses. Didier did indeed discuss the issue with his four nurses. 
You know, Didier, hand hygiene, it's surely our daily bread, but it's difficult. Why is it difficult? Because there's a whole treatment procedure. And what if we made a real study of it? Another boss would simply have ordered a study. Didier asked his nurses if they agreed with the idea. He involved them in every decision, just like a good manager with a degree from a business school. One could not accuse him of being manipulative. It's his Boy Scout side, says Valérie Sauvin. He carries everyone along with him, for good reason, since he had, in fact, been a Boy Scout, a captain of his soccer and hockey teams, a summer camp counselor, and he organized all the parties during medical school. He feels at ease in the community. But he's always two steps ahead of us, pointed out Sylvie Touvenot, another nurse who soon joined the initial team. Didier had already formulated his question. What makes people wash their hands or not? We need to do a study of the risk factors, he concluded. Along with Sylvie, Valérie, and their three colleagues Nicole, Pascal, and Anna, he devised an observation protocol. In December, day and night on weekends as well as during the week, his team systematically visited all the services at the hospital of the University of Geneva. During 20-minute periods, the nurses noted whether the medical personnel washed their hands every time a hand hygiene opportunity presented itself, such as manipulating a catheter. Didier, it's appalling, cried Sylvie Touvenot upon returning from intensive care. I was working there myself three weeks ago and I forgot to wash, just like everybody else. I can't believe it. By becoming an observer, she was made aware of her own shortcomings and they alarmed her. The first results came back. The average compliance rate was 48%. For nurses, it was 52%. Doctors, 30%. And midwives, 66%. The latter were perhaps influenced by Semmelweis's story. Radiology technicians, only 8%. That's catastrophic, moaned Didier. Do you think anyone ever explained it to them, a nurse wondered? She went to find the technicians in question and discovered that no one had ever told them they should wash their hands. The figures from the study were revealing. Lack of time led to poor compliance with hand hygiene. Overall, the more occasions for washing hands arose, such as in the emergency room, the less staff actually washed. Didier presented the results to his nurses. They smiled at him. We already knew that. What? You knew that? Well, yes, when we were stressed, there's too much work. We don't always make time to wash our hands. Didier was stunned. He had set up a rigorous epidemiological study only to end up with an obvious result. The instructions all stipulated that one should go to the sink, turn on the water, lather one's hands with soap, rub them together, rinse them, and dry them. No one had ever asked if it were possible in practical terms to the point that all the medical staff firmly claimed that they washed their hands 80% of the time when this was far from the truth. At the beginning of 1995, Didier visited the intensive care unit with a stopwatch in his hand. He discovered that nurses had on average 22 occasions to wash their hands per hour. In order to wash thoroughly, they needed one to two minutes. When you multiply that by 22, it's impossible. You can't clean your hands using soap and water. It takes too long. But there was another remedy available. We should use alcohol. No need to go to the sink every time. We put it on our hands. When it's dry, they're clean. This idea was incredibly simple. Everyone knows that alcohol is a powerful antiseptic. Every child cries when they feel its sting in their cuts and scratches. But it was not used frequently in hospitals, Didier recalls. We consumed 15,000 bottles per year back then, as opposed to 250,000 today. It was something reserved almost exclusively for use in the laboratory. That is where Didier had an extraordinary stroke of luck. William Griffiths, the pharmacist at the Hospital of the University of Geneva, was an expert on alcohol-based solutions. This Englishman, wearing his hair tied back in a ponytail, received a degree in pharmacology from the University of Liverpool in 1964 before moving to Switzerland because the salaries were higher. Or perhaps it was just out of love for the beautiful scenery, 
which stimulated his photographer's eye. He settled in Freiburg and worked in the Cantonal Hospital. In 1974, the hospital administration officially asked him to create an alcohol-based rinse for hands. An article just published in the British Medical Journal explained how rubbing one's hands with 10 milliliters of alcohol mixed with chlorhexidine, a powerful antiseptic patented in 1954, reduced bacterial accumulation on hands much more effectively than traditional techniques using antiseptic soap. But the only product available on the market back then was expensive and inadequate, explains William. His passion for finding the most elegant chemical formula his hypersensitivity, as well as a perfectionism that verged on idealism, led him to concoct 50 variations, each of whose antiseptic power and stability he then tested relentlessly. In mid-1976, Griffiths proposed a disinfectant formulation derived from the one he presented in the British Medical Journal. 75% isopropanol, a synthetic alcohol selected for its immediate action upon bacteria, 0.5% chlorhexidine to prevent the bacteria from attaching themselves subsequently and lingering, which was particularly useful to surgeons. He added water to these two essential ingredients because a 100% alcohol-based rinse failed to destroy germs. This detail is not devoid of philosophical interest. More is not necessarily better. At Freiburg, the hospital did not have the budget needed to patent the formula so it was offered freely to other Swiss hospitals. At the request of the hospital's head pharmacist, it was sent to Geneva in 1978, soon followed by William in person. Since then, he continued to experiment with the formulation, adding emulsifiers to render the rinse less aggressive for hands. William was already prepared, recounts Didier, as if he'd been waiting all this time for me to come and find him. He's the father of the alcohol-based hand rub. In 1995, they tested the formula with the nurses. William still had 50,000 ideas about variations. He hesitated going back to previous attempts. I was finally obliged to choose, otherwise he'd still be experimenting. Didier's pragmatism complemented the pharmacist's artistic sense. Gradually, it became obvious that the alcohol-based rinse was in fact better for cleaning hands. The dermatologists explain that soap is the skin's worst enemy. It breaks the disulfide bridges in the proteins linking the skin's cells. The skin then allows the water it contains to escape. As it dries, it loses its tonicity. Alcohol appeared to be the miracle product. Everyone had it right under their noses. Everyone knew its antiseptic value, but no one had thought of distributing it widely for use within hospitals. For a long time, that had been my dream, William related. But Didier made it possible by observing that it was unfeasible to use soap for every hand hygiene opportunity. Chapter 2, Part 5 In the spring of 1996, John Boyce stopped off in Geneva after attending a congress on Staphylococcus in nearby Annecy, France. He was a friend from way back, Didier says. We'd been running into one another since I started out. He's one of the best experts on infectious diseases in the United States. He's also concerned with hand hygiene and works with Elaine Larson, the leading American specialist in the field. Didier communicated the first results to him. They showed that compliance improved with the switch to alcohol and infections diminished. Then he sent Boyce to visit HUG with Valérie Sauvon, she presented to him the five key moments when, according to the first studies, hand cleansing was required. One, before touching a patient. Two, before any aseptic procedure, such as taking a blood sample. Three, after any risk of exposure to a biological fluid. Four, after touching a patient. And five, after having been in contact with a patient's environment. I don't know quite how to describe it, Didier says. John Boyce had something of a revelation. He went back to the United States with some bottles of our rinse and started to test it in his own hospital. He was the first to believe in the idea outside of the hospital of the University of Geneva. A few months later, the CDC in Atlanta asked Boyce to revise the official U.S. recommendations on hand hygiene, whose previous edition dated back to 1985. 
Did ye? You should write these with me. We can't do it without you. The objective was to define when and how hands needed to be cleansed, justifying each choice with scientific studies. It was an enormous task, explained Didier. We read 1,500 articles. I had them piled up all over my living room, he smiles. They paid us the royal sum of $2,000 for our trouble. Didier is amused by this anecdote, which shows how surreal investment priorities in medicine can be. A handful of dollars was spent to write up the recommendations that once they were applied would save thousands of lives every day. If the pharmaceutical companies had found a way to make big profits from this, money would have flowed freely, even if the actual health impact were far less great. In order to convince the medical profession of the pertinence of the new recommendations, John Boyce made use of a month's worth of examinations of patients with infectious diseases to carry out a radical experiment. During the first two weeks, at every hand hygiene opportunity, he washed his hands with soap. As a result, his hands were covered with abrasions and red patches, as if they'd spent five minutes in Semmelweis's chlorinated lime solution. The following two weeks, Boyce used the University of Geneva's alcohol-based rinse. In just a few days, his hands healed, regaining their suppleness and their normal color. We had proof by absurdity that alcohol was the only viable option if one wanted to increase compliance with hand hygiene.